Hello and welcome to episode 43 of the Crash and Ride podcast. I'm Patrick Ferguson. I'm your host. Today's episode is the second of our song explication series, and today I'm doing the song Straight Down by the band The Glands. 5-8 just did this song as part of the Athens cover-up. I'm the drummer in 5-8 if you're just tuning in and don't know who I am. Um, and uh, the Athens cover-up is where a bunch of Athens bands get together and play songs by other Athens bands. And the song that we covered, uh, one of them was uh, Straight Down by the Glands. And I was just struck by what an amazing song it is. And so the Glands, if you're not familiar, the Glands were an Athens band that was active from the late 90s up until the death of the singer-songwriter uh, Ross Shapiro in March of 2016. Ross was famously shy of the spotlight, and I actually called a friend to talk about that some. We'll get to that in a minute. But um, the core band, of course, is Ross Shapiro, a singer-guitar player, uh, one of my favorite drummers in the world, a guy named Joe Rowe, who I've known since we were teenagers. Um, on the record, The Glands, which came out in 2000 on Capricorn Records, Craig McQuiston played guitar and bass. Um, and then later, uh, Derek Olmsted was the uh, bass player for The Glands and is some ways has sort of become the archivist for The Glands' legacy. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, Ross Shapiro passed in March of 2016 from lung cancer. And if you've not heard of The Glands, you might ask yourself, like, why does a band that I've never heard of that, you know, probably sold less than 10,000 records need an archivist? Like, what is the big deal about the glands? And I'll tell you that the big deal is that the songs are amazing. Uh, they're every single gland song with maybe a tiny handful of exceptions that I couldn't tell you which they are. It's just a, a, a polished pop bullet of perfection. Like, there's just something amazing about Ross's ability to just hammer out a perfect power pop tune. And I think Straight Down is maybe one of the best examples of that. But um, you should know that the glands, like, there's an enormous amount of posthumous work that's come out because Ross just, he had a little recording rig in his house and he was constantly writing and constantly honing the songs that he'd already written. So when he passed, Derek Olmsted, um, the bass player, and as I mentioned before, sort of the unofficial archivist of the glands material, Got together with Dave Barbie, who's one of the best recording engineers in town and a guy who's Grammy nominated recording engineer, but also like really down to earth and, and understood kind of Ross's aesthetic as they had worked together some. And they combed through this enormous backlog of unreleased material and put together a double album, which was released under the title Double Coda. And there's a, a, just a treasure trove of tracks there. And there's also a five LP like retrospective uh, I called I Can See My House From Here that, that has the two original uh, Glanz records and then the posthumous record and then a whole lot of other stuff. I mean, Ross was constantly creating, but he was sort of famously like reclusive about his material, and so a lot of it just kind of stayed undiscovered until after he died. I spoke with Derek shortly after Ross's death, and I know some documentary filmmakers, and I, I know like lots of recording engineers, and I was like, Derek, if you can get a hold of that material, you know, you should like sit down with this guy who's making a movie about 5'8", my friend Mark Pelvinsky, and you can make a glance movie. And he was like, Ross, Ross wouldn't want that. Um, and I think that like at some point you have to sort of weigh like that the public needs to know about the glands they're so good now i will be the first to admit that i'm the guy at the party who grabs you by the lapels and says you've got to hear this band i know you know these bands and those are good bands but there's this other band like i've done this with people about the raspberries and the zombies and the 13th floor elevators and the glands are one of those bands that are just absolutely phenomenal band absolutely amazing musicians and craftsmen and the fact that they're un largely unknown seems to be a huge injustice so I tried to talk Derek into going more public with like Ross's legacy. And it, initially he was just like, it's too soon, man. And it, I don't think that it's necessarily what Ross would want, at least right now. And, and, and he begged off, but you know, since then, like Derek has opened up about a lot of this stuff and shared a lot of it. And it's just more is the better for everybody else because there's just so much great work there. But today we're going to talk about straight down. Now, understand that some of this is conjecture because I wasn't there, and and a lot happened between the release of Double Thriller, the first Glands record that came out in either 98 and 99, and the release of The Glands, which is their self-titled record on Capricorn Records in 2000. But Straight Down is um, on The Glands, and the personnel for the track, as far as I'm aware, are Ross Shapiro, guitar vocals, uh, Joe Rowe, of course, on drums, because such a good drummer. Joe is such a great drummer. And Craig McQuiston on guitars and bass. And 
the engineer for the session is Athens engineer Andy Baker. Now, Andy's living somewhere south of China now and doesn't live in Athens anymore. But for a long number of years, Andy was just the the best engineer in town, soft-spoken, diffident, highly creative. He would never say to you, like, I don't think you should play that part. But if you said, Andy, what should I do here? Every idea he had was brilliant. And he, he was perfect for these sessions. Now, when you hear this record, it's natural to ask the question, like, why am I just finding out about this now? Why wasn't this more ubiquitous? Like, at least as, as big as the Fountains of Wayne, because it's in that same power pop, like, perfection ballpark. And there are a lot of reasons that that might have been, not least of which is that the year this came out in 2000, Capricorn Records was sold in December of that year. Capricorn Records is, of course, the famous Southern rock label based out of Macon, Georgia. The Allman Brothers were on Capricorn, Marshall Tucker Band, um, like Cowboy, the Tommy Talton Project that was sort of an Allman spinoff. And, and, and they sort of tried to rekindle that fire in the 2000s, and then the record label sold right when the Glans record should have gotten legs and started to run. Um, now, there was a spinoff label called Velocet, which kind of came out of Capricorn, and it was a Walden, like the Walden family were the founders of Capricorn Records, and one of the Waldens started Velocet. I think it was Phil Jr., I'm not sure. Um, but And Velocet had Juicer for another Athens band, and they had uh, uh, the Glans, but it didn't really ever take off. And there might be a temptation to lay, like, blame for the obscurity that the glands are unfortunately cursed with, like, at the feet of Capricorn Records, but I don't think that's the whole story. Ross was famously shy of the spotlight uh, and was just not really interested in being, like, a celebrity or being interviewed or, or like, even talking to, to, like, journalists or press of any kind or even the promotion staff at Capricorn. But meanwhile, in Athens, like you could ask any musician, like who's the best songwriter in town? And, and Ross's name would come up in the top three or even just number one. Ross worked at like a sandwich shop here for like 17 years. And then he took over School Kids Records, which was the sort of downtown record store that was the first to have vinyl and the vinyl resurgence. And he was kind of classically the curmudgeonly record store clerk where if you brought CDs in to sell or if you were like making a stack of stuff to buy, he'd kind of flip through your stack and roll his eyes and go. <sighs> <laughs> and you'd often see him outside like talking on the phone and smoking a cigarette. And somebody once told me the story. They were walking by and they saw Ross out there and they said, hey, man, How's life? And Ross kind of covered up the speaker of the phone for a second and said, taken forever. And yet this like curmudgeonly kind of acid witted guy would turn in these like pop performances on these records that were just mind bendingly great. As I was trying to get a grip on like how to approach this amazing song and, and talk about it, I, I contacted Jason Thrasher, who's a photographer here in Athens who did a book of portraits of Athens musicians and we talked a little bit about Ross and let me let me let me play some of that for you okay I'm here with Jason Thrasher Jason is an Athens based photographer he has an amazing book called Athens Potluck and the conceit of the book was that he would shoot a handful of musicians that he admired and then he would ask them who would you recommend I shoot next and and of course early on People said Ross, but, uh, well, Jason, what was it like when you were trying to get Ross to sit to be uh, photographed for the book? Well, it's funny. I, I chose Laura Carter to be the first person in this project, and she immediately said she wanted to choose Ross. And I, I was like, well, that'd be great. Um, and I think I ran into him a day or two later, and he was just like, we were in downtown, like in front of, like what used to be the REM office. And he just stopped. He goes, can't do that. And just kept going. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Oh, okay. Um, I'll take that as a no for sure. And I called Laura back and she said, well, I was thinking about Will. And uh, it was funny. Actually, when she first said Ross, she goes, I want to ask Ross because I want to find out why he was such an ass to me when I worked with him at Eurorap. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, she was joking, but uh, so she she chose him, and then you know, so she ended up choosing Will Hart, who I was super happy with. Will's one of my favorite people in Athens, and one of my favorite musicians. So I just moved on, and then I think Will chose Julian Coster, who chose Vernon, who chose Jill Carnes, and then Jill says, "Oh, I think I want to pick Ross," 
And I was like, oh, that's funny. He's already said no. And then she goes, well, maybe if I pick Patterson Hood, he can get Ross to do it. And then I get to Patterson's house, and he's like, oh, I was thinking about Ross. And I was like, oh, God. He's already said no. <laughs> and he's like, well, I was thinking about Don Chambers, too. And and then so then it just became a joke. And I, you know, I said, I think I had told Ross a couple times, you know, I was like, dude, everybody keeps trying to pick you for this thing. And he's like, no way, not me. Did you get a feeling for why he was so reluctant? Well, this, he was still, uh, school kids was still open and I didn't really know him that well. Like I was always a little afraid of Ross and, and always, I always felt, you know, I was one of those people who always felt like he was skeptical of my musical choices in his store. And, uh, but, uh, you know, he was skeptical of everybody's musical choices. I know that now <laughs> <laughs> I should have asked around. Um, but you know, I, I also know that he, I, I, know, I think he liked some of my photos. So I don't, I don't think he was as hard on me as he could have been. Uh, but I, you know, I, I never really got that close to him until, you know, years later. And I think I start, started on this project in 2010 or 11, maybe 2010. And then I can't remember exactly what number he was, but I had shot on it, shot for maybe two and a half, three years. And I had just photographed uh, Michael Stipe, and then he chose Andy LeMaster. And I'm at Andy's house, and we're talking about you know, who I'd photographed and, and who, who, who was, had been a part of it. And I, I told him the story about Ross, and the, the, the working title for the book was called Ross Said No. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and then he just looks at me, and he goes, well, I'm choosing Ross. And there was no, like, no or check or like anything like that um he's like i'm choosing ross so i was like well i'll ask him again and by this time school kids had closed so i wasn't running into him downtown and he i i said well i I wasn't in a hurry at that point i was just kind of taking my time with the project and literally like a month later he called me and said, hey, man, the Glands are getting back together to play the Georgia Theater grand opening, and I, I really love to do a new photo of the band. And I said, oh, that's funny, because guess what? <laughs> <laughs> and I could still hear it. He was just like, oh, man. Yeah. Uh, well, let me think about it. And I was like, oh, my God, let me think about it. I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> So Jason went on to photograph Ross, and that picture is about to hang in the permanent collection of the Georgia Museum of Art because it's such an extraordinary portrait. And so Ross is someone who had to be sort of dragged into the spotlight if he could be forced to be in it at all. And I guess I could speculate as to why that might be, but that's kind of irresponsible, I think. I mean, he was an exceedingly private person, and yet he was held in such high regard by musicians in this community. Someone told me the story that they spoke to Ross's parents after his funeral, and they were surprised, his parents were surprised to see so many people there because they Ross didn't really talk about the glands with his parents, and he, they didn't know that the glands are sort of held up as a universal standard for how to be a great pop band by people in Athens, Georgia. And so they showed up at what they were expecting to be a fairly small affair with a few close friends, and there were many, many people there. I don't know the exact number, but, you know, more than 100. Like, Ross, Ross was very well-loved in this town and extremely talented. And I have a suspicion that if you heard me talk about him this way, he'd be really irritated with it. So let's let's jump into this song. Um, I do want to say up front that although I do use my guitar to make a couple of points about this song, I am not really a guitar player. I'm a drummer. Um, so uh, real guitar players and other music fans, let me apologize now for my terrible guitar playing. But um, anyway, uh, here's how the song starts. You've got this kind of stabby A chord. And it what I love about it is that 
I feel like this sort of calls back to a mid seventies transition from what had gone before, which was primarily in rock and roll, primarily blues based rock. Um, that was like <clears throat> sort of driven by the interest in blues of the English rockers like, you know, Cream and Eric Clapton and, and, and Led Zeppelin and all that into this transition into this more kind of on top of the beat, direct, choppy guitar line like um, Gang of Four or there was a band called Dr. Feelgood with this phenomenal guitar player named Wilco Johnson who was sort of the godfather of that style. And I feel like there's a little bit of influence from Caribbean music. Between 1948 and 1974, probably, there was this huge wave of immigration from Jamaica to the United Kingdom. And it brought with it all this Caribbean culture and West Indian culture like Calypso music and two-tone or what we now call ska and, and, and reggae stuff. And I feel like that was the culture that was influencing the guitar playing of bands like The Clash and The Buzzcocks and these early punk bands more than, say, this American Southern black idiom of blues music. So you get this sort of cross-cultural pollination thing, and if you listen to those early Clash records, there's reggae influence all over them, but also I think there was some of that with XTC, and that bled over into bands in America like television. You get this, like, sharp downbeat on the one and three or upstroke on the two and four that's very reminiscent of like jamaican music um only you know when it's played by these sort of speed driven white working class kids it's a little choppier and less laid back and i can i can imagine like people listening to this and rolling their eyes like dude i don't know how you get from reggae to xtc or whatever but like it, it really is a matter of like being on the downbeat of the one for the sort of punk version versus the upbeat of two. So like here's a typical feel for like a rock steady or reggae guitar part. And here's kind of a similar feel to what's happened in the Glenn song and a lot of that sort of mid 70s pre hardcore punk stuff. So really the the elemental difference here is just like where the downstroke falls on the beat, you know, with the reggae thing it's kind of behind the beat. Um, but with this sort of pre-hardcore punk thing, it's right on top of the beat. But I feel like these two styles don't exist like in different universes as far as like what's happening with English rock and roll um, and the sort of punk explosion of the mid to late 70s. So a lot of the guitar playing you hear described as angular, which there was a whole discussion amongst a group of friends of mine once about what a useless term that is to describe bands like Wire and Gang of Four and early television and stuff like that. But I think what people mean when they say that is rather than being behind the beat and kind of like blues influence, what they mean is that on top of the beat, like choppy thing that Ross is doing in the intro. Now the vocals start immediately and the lyrics on this song are very impressionistic. It's kind of hard to say exactly what it's about. It seems like it's about like the motivations behind some kind of obsessive behavior that's not okay. Uh, one time that lasts forever, one time that's deep inside, I want to shake all over again. Don't know exactly what Ross is talking about there, but it doesn't seem like, you know, it, it's something entirely wholesome. Also, listen closely. I'm going to play the intro again, and there's like a single note accent that goes from right ear to left ear to right ear again, which is kind of running behind the vocals on the main guitar. It's pretty cool. One time that lasts forever One time that's deep inside I want to And then Joe Rowe comes in with this great 16th note pickup on the three, the four of the measure previous and the one and the of the downbeat. And we're off to the races. So it's this great eighth note driven backbeat that kind of calls the like candy O era cars to mind, like just a really solid groove. Now, when I say Joe Rowe is a fantastic drummer, it, it's because he can like nail down an airtight groove like that and still swing just a little bit like Ringo Starr. And it it's just all on display here. Like that first verse of the song before the chorus is um, 
a great exercise of dynamics and and just just super super tight groove. Ross's lyrics continue to be a little bit inscrutable here. One time is better than no times. I can't lose for doing a favor. Want to shake all over again. I really love the weird emphasis Ross puts at the end of the word shake. It's uh, <laughs> weirdly reminiscent of that like CBGB suicide Mink Deville, like late '70s scene where front men were kind of haughty and and a little arrogant maybe and. Um, It feels like Ross is driving a point home there, though I'm not sure what it is. The lyrics seem to imply more kind of obsessive behavior, and and yet there's a kind of like disdain about it that I really dig. Now, at the end of the first verse, we get to the first chorus, and um, the drums and bass go to double time. This chop, eighth note, dot, 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 which is, um, you know, it's very Motown, uh, a lot of that. Detroit soul stuff had that double time thing and it just it sets up the chorus I I mean I realize anybody could hear this but I point it out because it's so masterful in the way that it sets the verse and the chorus apart and then we get the lyrics um you go straight down what's the matter don't you trust me I only want it on the way down in a bad way um Nobody sings the line, what's the matter, don't you trust me, uh, without a hint of irony. Like, that's not something that someone who's not a used car salesman or a sociopath really says to people. <laughs> so, like, I feel like the, the 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 portrait of this character that Ross is painting is that he's not a savory dude and he's not got whoever he's speaking to's best interests in mind. <laughs> There's so much great bass playing going on in this chorus. I mean, there's like two melody lines that are, he's doing a tick-tock thing uh, with a high part, alternating with a lower co- counter melody. And I, I, it's just so masterful. Let's listen to it again. It's just so good. Like that that part is um man, it's just an enormous like slice of, of of brain candy for me. Like it it I love the fact that that melody alternates as everything else is ascending. Um and then you get two bars of um the regular tempo of the song of four four and then it goes to a half time part. So the chorus goes double time regular time, half time, in the space of 16 measures. Now there's something awesome happening here with the rhythm guitar. Um, I talked a lot about tremolo and my explication of the Bruce Springsteen song Born to Run. And I went ahead and got my Greer Arbuckle Tribolo out again because there's a cool tremolo part in the chorus here. So the dominant chord in the halftime section is... A down to F. and um, But every time he hits the A, there's this massive tremolo on it. So it sounds like this. Now, most tremolos have two parameters, right? They have depth and speed. And speed is is how you adjust the number of those oscillations per minute or second on your tremolo. And in this little breakdown, someone is sweeping that knob. So it sounds like one speed of oscillation at first, and then it like goes up a little and down a little. <laughs> And that's one of the things that makes this song so fucking great. There's all this like masterful songcraft, great hook, uh, you know, really excellently delivered vocals, and then just pure ear candy uh, in the instrumentation. Now, I wasn't there, and I don't know the whole story uh, of the recording session, but I can say that I I do know from uh, reading interviews with Derek Olmsted, who I've mentioned before is kind of the band's uh, unofficial archivist and was the bass player on later stuff. 
Ross was an obsessive tinkerer. He was always working on parts and working on songs, and it really shows here. Like, that's just some magic, and I love it. And then they drop back into the verse, and, and now it's just it's a straight-ahead rock song. Um, the lyrics for the second verse uh, are, I want to live but not be found. I want this one and that one too. I want to shake all over again. One time is better than no times. I can't lose for doing the favor. I want to shake all over again. Um, just a restatement of the initial theme of the first verse, but you know, the band is just slamming here. Another great thing about Joe Rowe as a drummer, he knows what a drum hook is. And here he redelivers that 16th note pickup heading into the second half of the second verse, just like he did in the second half of the first verse. Now, when I learned this song for the 5-8 show the other night, I made sure I did that every time because it, it honors Joe's amazing like compositional skill and his thoughtfulness about continuity in parts. So we, we finish out the second verse and we start a double chorus for the second chorus. We go back to the double time um, that has the like two bars of regular tempo and then back to the double time and then we have another halftime section. Uh, this I meant to mention this earlier. The halftime section has the line, is the back seat all mine? I'm, I'm not judging, but I, I do sort of think that like once you're older than 11 years old, anything that happens in the back seat of a car is maybe a little shady or, I mean, God, I'm not judging. Like lots of fun is had in back seats, but yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly what Ross is singing about in this song, but um, I get the drift. Now, when we learned this song last week, Dan and I had a little discussion about the lady with the poodle, and we just couldn't come up with any idea what it was about. But it's very impressionistic, and I do love the way that Ross delivers the line. Um, it's almost a little coy. Uh, and uh, that's sort of the second half of the double course. We get another passage of the uh, regular tempo, and then... You know, the halftime breakdown again, which is really effective here. And then we're into a, this phenomenal guitar solo. Now, a word before we jump into the guitar solo, a word about... Athens and big rock guitar solos. Peter Buck is not a big solo player. Um, there was a band uh, of guys from here called Bandway years ago, and it was uh, like a sort of party rock uh, parody band, and they did big guitar solos, and there were a couple of sort of parody metal bands here in Athens. I think one was called Poolside, and they did big rock guitar solos, but for the most part, like, Athens bands don't, like, dig in and do a big pentatonic denim jacket with the fleece collar, big rock, horns in the air guitar solo, and yet on this tune, man, we get a fucking ripper. <laughs> I mean, check out that double stop bin. This is like bad company stuff for like Jimmy Page. And it, it might be ironic. I have no idea. Like there was a strong level of like kind of sarcasm and disconnect and, 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 and Ross is like primary persona. But God damn, I unapologetically love this guitar solo. Absolutely love it. And that may mark me as a fool or a rube. But if I am a fool, sir, I wear it proudly. Yeah, 
it just shoot that guitar solo straight into my veins, man. It's so it's this is this song is such a perfect bit of power pop mastery and that solo just puts it right over the top. It's so good. And then we have another double chorus um with the poodle line and the backseat line and um I still don't know what Ross is singing about, but I don't think it matters at this point. You go straight down, what's the matter? Don't you trust me? I only want it on the way down in a bad way is the back seat all mine. Way down, see a lady with a poodle. It's the color of tomato in a bad way is the back seat all mine. Um, and then just a very brief uh, call back to the halftime section and we're out. <laughs> If you listen really carefully in, in those last two choruses, you can hear there's a note sustaining really high, and it's either someone standing in front of a, a very loud amplifier and letting the feedback uh, come through on that one note, or they're playing it with an ebo and it's alternating with another note, and I'm not really good with intervals, so I don't know if it's a whole step or down or what, but uh, let me listen to it right here. It starts on the low note and then goes up here. That's just something I thought was super cool that I didn't want to let it like get away without pointing it out. The fact that there's feedback sustained there at the end of the song uh, and then it's that same note makes me think it's probably not an Ebo. Um, man, and it's, there's this great kind of cacophonous sustain there as the tremolo is, is dialed, the speed is dialed back all the way to zero at the last minute. So the whole thing feels like a big machine winding down. And that's straight down by the glance. Three minutes, 18 seconds. Um, one of my favorite songs of all time. Certainly one of my favorite Glenn songs. Um, and, man, it's just so good. Ross, as I've mentioned before, leaves behind a tremendous amount of material thanks to the efforts of Derek Olmsted and, and David Barbie and and I'm sure Joe Rowe to some extent. They've assembled um, a big five-record um, compilation of everything called I Can See My House From Here. And, you know, I think I'm just going to buy that. It, there's no reason not to have it. And then, of course, there's the double coda, uh, double LP of unreleased material that came out a little before that. Um, I highly recommend that you dig deep in the Glenn's uh, catalog because it's all really good. Um, Ross was an amazing talent, and he was gone too soon. That's all for our second song explication episode. Thanks for listening. Uh, thanks to Jake Kreger, our erstwhile producer. He sends me show notes on every episode, and uh, if the show is better now than it was the first time you heard it, that's all due to Jake. Uh, thanks to Gene Wolfolk and the Powder Room. They provide all the music that you heard in this episode that is not the glands. The intro music and the music that you hear under my voiceover now are both from the Powder Room album Curtains, which is available on their Bandcamp site, thepowderroom.bandcamp.com. Thanks to Heil Audio for these two PR40 microphones that I use for all my voiceover work and all my interviews. They gave me a great deal on them, and they're really great mics for podcasting. I used to use them in the studio on snare, kick, drum, bass, cabinet, whatever. You know, they were really flexible studio mics, but it turns out they're great broadcast mics, too. And most especially, thank you for listening. Thanks for buying T-shirts and coffee. Um, you're helping me keep going by doing that. Hey, remember, uh, Crash and Ride merchandise makes great Christmas gifts. So hit me up, crashandridepodcast.com slash store. And until we meet again, take care of yourself. Be kind to yourself. Ask for help if you need it. Go see live music, support your favorite band, and remember... Loud guitars save lives. Right.